Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to talk to Sacklane Chowdhury, who is doing his PhD in physics at the University of Oxford. You're most welcome, sir. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. Um, I think we, we met under very interesting circumstances, but I'm glad to be here. I didn't. <laughs> we did, I'm, I'm a big, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm a viewer of your show, so I didn't think I would be on it myself, but it's a privilege to be here. No. Indeed. Well, I'm very, I'm very glad you uh, agreed to cut your cam on, actually. But before we get to, um, sorry, you, you've agreed uh, to come on to discuss some of the issues surrounding the study of physics at Oxford. But before we get to that, can I just ask a very basic question? What exactly is physics? It's an excellent question. And I think in the modern world, a good definition is, it's the study of the what you would regard as the laws of nature in in the sense that you you have matter and the interaction between matter and energy uh, on a fundamental level but a, a good metaphor i like to use is if you consider mathematics to be like english language grammatical structures mm. um, how to employ sentences types of sentences then physics is like english literature it's a description of the universe itself uh, mm. using mathematical language um, in, in the best in with the best model or the most rigorous model you have at the time um, so I, I use that analogy um, so it's, I would say it's the mathematical description of the laws of nature we see in the universe right so a proficiency in mathematics or understanding of mathematics is obviously key to understanding this language uh, that is deployed to try and understand um, the, the, the the laws of nature as you say Yes. Right. OK. Now, does the study of physics at a top Western university, which obviously Oxford is, present any challenges to faith as a Muslim, do you think, in your experience? It's interesting. I, if I was to speak of my own experiences, I think the issues begin a lot earlier in one's educational development than by the time you get to university. Mm. Um, I think the way we learn science in schools so science without understanding the philosophy of science ah. which i know you've had people speak on your show about before the the disconnect between the two means that you start to view um religion and faith as almost a sef a separate thing to what reality actually is right so science yeah. science takes precedence over faith from an early age mm. um you learn you, well, I mean, it depends. I, I would say, if, if, I, if I speak about what I experienced, mm. science is given, even within the, the, I'm from a kind of subcontinent immigrant community in the UK, the, the scientific studies are given this really high precedence, medicine, engineering, right. um, they're regarded very, very highly as some kind of very secure type of knowledge, mm. whereas religious faith hasn't been given the same treatment, I would say. And so mm. when you study science without understanding what science is, you almost uphold it as this um, real gold standard of what knowledge is. Right. And so by the time you get to university, actually, a lot of people struggle with their faith because they see that faith is somehow something not rooted in reason, but science right. is rooted in reason and can be verified. Uh, and so, Yes, I would say by the time you get to university, a lot of people have unfortunately internalized some of these um, false dichotomies, I would call them, between f faith and reason. Uh, and also, then you get to a place where the majority of your teachers and the majority of your peers uphold a very different worldview, especially mm. if you're somewhere like Oxford. The London universities have a, a greater... Um, or, or kind of inner city universities have a greater uh, peer group of Muslims. But when you go to Oxford or Cambridge or uh, some of the more uh, the Durham, places like that, more remote universities, uh, more, I would say, traditionally white universities, um, you, you're not, or, or you're more not secular like, universities. Yeah, you're yeah. yeah. Like, you're just Demographically, as a Muslim, I'm in like London, where obviously... Yes. Yeah. Indeed. But I just and, 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 sorry, yeah. carry on. I interrupt you. No, no, sorry, you, you go ahead. Well, no, you, you just very briefly touched on uh, an element that you said was missing from the uh, the school experience of uh, experiencing science and religion, and that's a philosophy of science. 
And I, I, I think it's a really interesting observation. I think it's actually quite key. How, how does the philosophy of science help us to have a, a, a deeper understanding of what's actually going on in science rather than just mm. sort of a, a objective, factual, disinterested, neutral enterprise that there are actually yeah. suppositions and assumptions uh, philosophers would say that are built into this very project, which are important to know about. I would argue. So, what 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 is the philosophy of science, and why is and how does it help us to understand these issues better? Do you think? Yeah. So I suppose there are different um, ideas about what the philosophy of science is. Mm. Um, Popper's interpretation is probably the one that's kind of taught in in universities most frequently now, and it's the idea yeah. that. A scientific statement or, or fact is one that should be inherently falsifiable. Yeah. So you should be able to disprove it uh, mm. in in and of its nature. So science, in that sense, there's this kind of idea of paradigms mm. in which un under a certain umbrella, a lot of things make sense and fit within a model. Right. But there are slight anomalies within that model, things you can't describe, things that don't quite fit the model perfectly. Right, and then over time, the uh, development of a new model or an adaptation of the previous model can then uh, encompass more of more of the the things that we weren't able to describe previously, uh, and so this kind of scientific progress, you could say, in how mm. accurately we can model things, particularly in physics, is um, is what science is about. It, we, science. I, I mean, a, I would say a high level physicist is very much aware. And you must be aware of the, in fact, in every exam you take, you have to always state your assumptions. Uh -huh. um, so it could be the conservation of energy or the conservation of linear momentum. Um, and you essentially, it's very interesting, but you use the model that gets you the, mo the, the, the accuracy of answer that you need for what you're doing. So you never try and use a more sophisticated model then you actually need to for your description. So parsimony, of, of this idea of economy of knowledge is key. And I mean, there's a very famous text, of course, by Thomas Kuhn called The Structure of Scientific yes. Revolutions. Uh, he's a Absolutely. Chicago professor, which uh, gave the theoretical explanation of, of paradigm shifts. So how, you know, for, obviously the famous ones are the Newtonian paradigm, paradigm shift, where we had a mechanistic universe of, of you know, discrete blocks and like billiard balls bouncing off each other uh, and and uh, an objective laws of physics and so on and then we had Einstein come along beginning of the 20th century with his general theory of relativity and everything came very different with probability waves and and so on and uh, so that that's a that's an, one example of a paradigm shift that is obviously the most famous one I suppose um, but you're talking about e even in exams even at Oxford you have to state your your models your assumptions your working uh, models uh, uh, before you go ahead and do what you do in the exam. But um, so you're not just going straight in. You have to say, these are my assumptions. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and they're inherent. Um, and, and you must state them. Otherwise, your answer, you know, if your foundations aren't strong, then no one believes in the structure you create, which is essentially uh, how scientific models work. And, and you can go further back from physics because essentially all physics is based in mathematics or described using mathematics right. and mathematics really isn't science it's a branch of logic it's a, wow. it's a type of philosophy in the sense that science is also a natural philosophy but it's become so removed from philosophy yeah. we almost see it as separate i yeah. think mathematics is still you can see a little bit of um really fundamental philosophy in the in in mathematical ideas and and actually one thing i would say is the again the in the west the the kind of divergence we see between religion or faith uh, as the term is used and science historically wasn't there you mentioned isaac newton he was mm. although not uh, a traditional christian he had a conception of the idea of god he was a deist in that sense and so was einstein um and uh, famous people like lemaitre yeah. uh who was a very famous cosmologist these people had a very firm idea of the existence of God. And they were also philosophers. I think the kind of specialization mm. of knowledge, uh, we don't really get polymaths anymore in that sense. No, uh, yeah, the specialization yeah. of knowledge being a very modern phenomena, this kind mm -hmm. of splintering of knowledges has led people to perhaps have a very narrow view of their kind of field being the 
independent from other forms of knowledge, that, that mm. false independence they perceive, uh, where they don't really understand the assumptions they're working with, is one of the issues I, 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 I've I think, observed. I think this is very true. There's increased specialization leading to a, a split in... Uh, uh, but there are some wonderful exceptions. I mean, one of my favorite um, writers on this is uh, John Polkinghorne, um, who was famously a professor of mathematical physics at Cambridge University, no less. But also, after he resigned there to become an Anglican priest, of all things, um, he became equally eminent as a Christian theologian. He wrote lots of books, and I had the privilege... Uh, actually having met him in, in London as I was asking him a few questions. Another one, of course, is Alistair McGrath, who did his PhD, I think, in biochemistry at your university in Oxford um, and is now a celebrated uh, Christian theologian as well. And they both write extensively on the interaction between science and faith, science and religion in a very kind of um, well, in an academic way, but not in a sectarian way. So there's much that can uh, other people, of, people of other kinds of faith can listen in like Muslims to what they say. And, and be enriched by their discourse, I think. Absolutely, and, and I think one thing I would say is having grown up in the West, um, despite being from a, an Eastern background, we can have a slightly, a view as Muslims that there isn't knowledge to be gained from people who aren't Muslims, mm. perhaps. Mm. Um, and I don't think that's quite correct, not only was you know John Polkinghorn very very funny if you managed to watch any of his debates on YouTube a very intelligent and, and humorous man Fair. there there are there are n great benefits you can take from the thinking and teachings of these people so long mm. as you're grounded in your own faith you know yes. so, so long as you don't become a, a trinitarian or you don't these are not evangelicals who proselytize their faith these no. are considered, reflective individuals who listen right. and, and have an inquiring mind. So they're not a threat, I don't think, to faith. No, and, and what they might give you that you perhaps won't find in your own community is because they are, have also grown up in the West as you have. Um, they may give you a viewpoint that you relate more with mm. than your perhaps your local imam. Not to say that these people don't have fantastic forms of knowledge, but they're, mm. but they're not aware of the challenges you may face, as you say, at a high-level university. Mm -hmm. or, or um, and in, in that sense uh, you know Abdul Hakim Murad at, at Cambridge is an excellent person to listen to or yes. Hamza Yusuf across in America these people yeah. who have come to Islam from Western upbringings mm. um, have I would say have a better grasp of some of the challenges that young people face mm. and have read widely enough to give mm. people the tools and the arguments needed to defend their faith mm. um, against the threats that perhaps the widespread secularism in universities, uh, which is prevalent now. Mm. Well, uh, on that point, really, why are, why are so many top uh, scientists in the West apparently atheist? Um, I'm not just thinking about Richard Dawkins here, who is obviously a notorious atheist, but you know, there's a very substantial atheism, it seems, uh, present yeah. in the uh, the Western um, scientific community, which always struck me as slightly odd. But uh, um, is, is there a, a sociological explanation or some other explanation that we can help to unravel that mystery? Yeah, of course. I think there are a few things. I think on a fundamental level, um, humility is not a virtue that comes easily to those who are more intelligent than the majority of people around them. Mm, mm. Um, human beings are predisposed to pride in many forms, but intellectual uh, pride is very, very can be very difficult to diagnose, and can mm. can hide very well. Uh, but essentially, once you start to see, as a scientist, how capable you are of um, describing and discovering new phenomena about the universe, mm. um, you perhaps don't. You, it becomes harder for you to admit that there are things that you cannot describe, that you cannot quantify, that you cannot measure. It's fundamental. It feels almost insulting to admit that to yourself. That okay, I, you know, I can't measure the soul. Therefore, it's better for me to say the soul doesn't exist than mm. to have some element of humility and say, okay, perhaps there's a sphere in which my my skills, my intellect, uh, are capable of comprehending things. And then there's something outside of that that mm. isn't within that. And I, I have to be honest with myself and be able to say, okay, 
here are my limitations. That's one thing, one thing I've seen. Another thing is... Oh, sorry, just, just sorry. Yeah. Uh, 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 very helpful what you just said but at the very end there you just let that some that that's what you have seen so this is something you actually witnessed at oxford university <laughs> without going to to, to parochial you it's an observation of yours rather than just a, a theoretical reflection you've noticed this issue being yeah. a, right well paul i must say it's not something i've seen just in people around me i for a long time was very i mean you could almost have called me an agnostic and i know you have a widespread audience so my honesty mm -hmm. is not to shock people it's more to say that there are doubts and periods in your life which you go through uh, and and i these are observance observations i made about myself as well when when i when i came back to uh the religion that i was born into uh from i, I wouldn't say I, I would say outwardly i never really stopped appearing like a muslim i i wasn't in clubs or you know doing some of those other things but my internal um my internal consolidation of my faith wasn't quite there. The, you know, the, the, the belief right. in the unseen as referred to in the Quran, I didn't have that at the time. Um, right, interesting. But sorry, that's a side point. It's not just I observe these things. No, it's, it's not, it's, it's, no, with respect, it's not a side point. I think it's really interesting what you're saying. Yeah. Because obviously, you know, to, to, to do a PhD in physics at Oxford, you've got to have a pretty high IQ to put it. So you, you, are, one, you are one of these people who, um, potentially might be arrogant, full of hubris. Obviously, you're not looking at you. You're not such a person at all. Uh, but but the temptation was there uh, for mm. certain kinds of people, uh, and you are one of those certain kinds of people, clearly. Um, and so it's fascinating you wrestled with this, and you came back to faith and belief in the unseen uh, and, uh, as, a, as a Muslim. And um, were there any issues in that transition back to faith that are relevant to our discussion, do you think? Yeah, and I think we'll definitely, we will touch upon them. But I want to first perhaps um, finish addressing your question about why I think so many scientists in the West are atheist. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's also, um, again, like I said, it's, it's statistically more people now are atheist and therefore more scientists are also atheist. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's also that trend we see in society. And like I said, we, we do science without the philosophy of science. And so for a while we had science, I think, as the real gold standard of what people should believe in, scientism, as it's referred to yeah. by famous philosophers like Thomas Nagel. Um, mm. But actually, now I think we have ideology trumping science. Interesting. So science actually now is giving way to what people simply want to believe in. And an obs observation I've made within wow. myself and other people is that often we choose our positions and then justify them to ourselves afterwards. Yes. yes. And science is not immune from this. And I don't want to speak specifically about certain things, but I, you've spoken about them on your channel previously, that it doesn't matter what argument you give to someone. And this is kind of Quranic as well even if you show them a miracle, if yes. if they are deaf and blind mm. to receiving that truth, whether mm. it be scientific, religious or otherwise, you human beings are fascinating in that we, they really won't move from their position. Even if somewhere they know they're wrong, they simply don't want to be. Yes, they yes. Simply don't want to myself be. And, and in others as well, it seems to be very characteristic. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we, we, we have this kind of ego that attaches itself to an idea. And then the idea trumps everything else. And science is also giving way in the modern world to ideology. Um, it's no longer this, this uh, kind of bastion of, of great you know, knowledge that everyone subscribes to. No, it's kind of now, this is what we feel like doing and let's see if science backs us up. But if it doesn't, then science can also go away. So the idea that science uh, traditionally is a fearless endeavor to objectively look for the yeah. truth, Whatever the cost, we will just go where the evidence leads. You're saying is becoming a casualty to certain ideologies, which we've not yes. named, being because we're being diplomatic. But uh, <laughs> what one just simply needs to open a newspaper, and um, it's all and, there. <laughs> yes, just to give uh, clarity, what we're talking about. Um, um, but you're you're right. There are certain things which have which seem to be based on science, which are now just ignored. Um, even perhaps you're saying by scientists, perhaps uh, in yes. the name of this ideology which is now ascendant in the west exactly and so if you extend that argument to perhaps someone like richard dawkins or sam harris mm. i think most of them don't want to believe in god yes 
Right. So, and I and I think actually, if you think about some of the hardcore atheist positions, right? Just a statement like "something can come from nothing" mm. for a lay person. Mm. I think that's a lot more. I think that rests in a lot more faith that the universe can create itself from nothing, not potential, not wave functions from literally nothing, yes. than the idea that something created something. Yes. Just to use a very simple argument. And so, by, you know, this is just one example, and it's not necessarily rigorously philosophical. That's not my training. But for the lay people out there, if you just consider what certain atheists are asking you to believe in, it is that nothing can produce something or something can come from nothing. And why is, I, I, I know it may sound incredibly obvious and self-evident why that's absurd, but, but philosophically, it's important, I think, to understand why it's absurd rather than simply taking it for granted that, oh, yeah, of course. It's, why is it absurd or illogical, whatever you care to, to say that something can come from nothing because i'm asking i don't quite understand what is nothing i mean this is a yeah. philosophical question because is nothing a thing out there from mm -hmm. which nothing comes like you know it's like, like an empty room but then an empty room isn't really empty because it exists in a space-time continuum it has yes. uh, you know it's not quite as nothing as you would think so the very yeah. concept of nothing perhaps needs to be defined more clearly before we can say it's illogical or incoherent or absurd to say that something can come from nothing. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. And the famous atheist Lawrence Krauss yes. tried to um, his, book. Yeah. his book. He tried to he tried to explain how something could come from nothing, yes. but his nothing relied upon the idea that particles in physics can spontaneously emerge from potential fields. Right. But that's not nothing. That's a potential to exist. Right. You know, so you're very right, Paul. I'm perhaps not the best person to ask this because it's actually, it's very much about epistemology and etymology, how you describe nothing, nothingness. Yes. But I think on a very basic human level, it's quite easy for us to understand that you can't even conceive of what nothing is. Yeah. <laughs> because the paradox is because you're conceiving. Yeah, it's it's very difficult to do. It's inconceivable. And so, yeah. It is inconceivable. And and so therefore, when the atheist asks you to believe, and it is a belief, he cannot, he or she or they cannot prove to you that something can emerge from nothing. It's not possible. Mm. Right? Mm. And and here's here's what I was referring to earlier, uh, Paul. One of the one of the things that they will say is that the so the first law of thermodynamics is essentially that energy is conserved. Right. Right. And f therefore, how could all the energy in, in the universe have been, so it can't be created or destroyed. And so all the energy in the universe, therefore, what does it emerge from? Where does it come from? Is, mm. a, is a question you could ask. Indeed. Uh, logically speaking, the Big Bang. So what, so what gives the Big Bang the energy, the impetus to exist? And so a famous kind of atheist refutation is, okay, the laws of physics and nature only apply within the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's what we would call an inherently metaphysical claim, I would say. Mm -hmm. You can't prove that. That's not a provable statement. Right. You cannot scientifically show me that that is the case or not the case. Mm. It doesn't fall under Popper's definition of a scientific statement. Mm. That's falsifiable. Mm. Yes, that is falsifiable. And so this is what I, I'm trying to explain to you, is it's partly hubris, and it's mm. partly that people simply don't want to believe in God anymore. And I think what it really comes down to is you have intellectual pride, but you have moral pride as well. You, right. Part of the injunction of believing in God is that you have to do what God says, or you have to try. Or in Islam, submit, submission or submission. Yes, literally or, exactly, humility. which is a sign of humility. Very um, much so. Yes, and you have to therefore um, accept that there is objective morality and i think that's where a lot of people just don't like it they're like and and it's fine it's fine if you can admit to yourself i just don't want to be told what to do mm. right i don't want to accept that there are things that i've been told by god to do and not to do i'd rather mm. come up with my own moral code than mm. really what the modern world is 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 um, a blend between scientism and ex existentialism Gosh, you know, most people I, I, like, I hold that thought. I'm just thinking a headline here. Atheism blend of scientism and existentialism. That's, that's a great uh, uh, phrase. That, yeah. Ashraf. 
I shall nick that if that's all right with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no copyrights here. Um, <laughs> but that's what it appears to me is most people aren't really atheist in, in, in the sense that they haven't really internalized what it means to be atheist. They haven't looked at the metaphysics of atheism. There are very sophisticated atheists out there. Mm. You know, they are, and I'm not saying that they're not intelligent people. They clearly no. are. No. Um, and perhaps, and I would say far more intelligent than me, that they, they have far more training uh, in their fields, respectively. And they perhaps have internalized some of it. You know, someone like Daniel Dennett, how, however ridiculous some of his notions were, at least they went to the logical extreme of what his his idea of materialism was and and free will not existing but it's so counterintuitive to the human experience that you start to realize that most people don't behave like they don't have free will yes yes right I mean, just just to give one example of people who were making this up uh, professor thomas nagel who's one of america's leading philosophers um he's actually written some yes. really good, good, good books actually on uh, critiquing various things that even Muslims would agree with. Anyway, mm -hmm. he, he has said publicly that he is an atheist because he doesn't want to believe in God. It, it's yes. a volitional choice. It's not like yes. I don't see any evidence or how can you believe in God? No, I don't believe. I don't want to believe in God for my own personal reasons. Yes, and he's not the only one to have said this, and it is, as you say, a kind of honesty which is uh, kind of touching in a way. Although whether it's, it's morally acceptable is another question, of course. But um, these people do exist, and some of them are very prominent atheists who do not want to believe in God, not because for, because for uh, their own personal agenda. Thomas Huxley famously was another one. Yes, absolutely, and 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 it's really interesting. But atheists have always existed, mm. um, even in the Islamic tradition or in, in Greek philosophy. Um, there were materialists, atheists, people who thought that the universe was in, infinite, not not yes. uncreated. Yeah, uh, so therefore, you didn't need a god, right? Aristotle, it even in the Islamic right, the universe, yeah. right, right. And Ibn Sina was kind of similar in the Islamic tradition, although he wasn't an atheist. He held some certain yes. positions, um, but the it's essentially always been the same questions being asked. Mm, yes. I think. The, uh, one thing I've realized about myself, you, you referred to me as someone who's intelligent earlier. I've never really had an, inte in, um, an original thought, Paul. Every question or doubt I had about religion had been addressed by some medieval scholar mm. a thousand years ago or 500 years ago. Um, you know, if you're looking at the Christian tradition, you have some very, very um, good medieval scholarship there. Uh, Thomas Aquinas is someone that people refer to, but yep. he based a lot of his work actually on um, Ibn Rushd, Averroes, uh, previous previous to him. And so, mm -hmm. even if you look at these scholars, they the human condition is unchanging, mm -hmm. and and to think that we have now unveiled some part of our intellect that other people didn't have previously. Yes, we may have more knowledge about certain things, but the metaphysical questions we ask about our own existence. Have always been the same right. and our ability to do philosophy or our ability to comprehend things our, our cognitive faculties have been the same for a long time and so these questions about the universe um metaphysical questions not scientific questions right have been answered in by our scholarship a long time ago some of these books are translated some aren't you know the Kalam cosmological argument by William, Dr. William Lane Craig, is a book you refer to quite frequently. But actually, it's this it's arrogance again. You kind of see arrogance everywhere. It's this mm. idea that we now know better than mm. those people knew. Mm. We are somehow more intelligent than someone like Al Ghazali or Ibn Rushd or yeah. uh, or any of the or for, uh, Ibn Farabi or any of those people, right? Al Farabi, any of those scholars. Um, yeah. It's just we don't have access to their knowledge anymore, or mm. it's not taught to us right. in a sophisticated fashion. So then we start to idolize uh, some of the modern intellects who, who do propose atheistic views about mm. the world. But actually, they're talking about... Here's the thing. Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, these guys are talking about things that they're not trained in. I'm far more likely to listen to Thomas Nagel, who's a who's a philosopher by training yes or even nietzsche or mm. uh, or immanuel kant p 
people who had philosophical training mm. and listen to their metaphysical arguments than people who are from the realm of science, which is where I exist as well. Trying, you know, stay in your lane is kind of what I would say. It's, it's, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm sure that these people are intelligent, but they're talking about things that don't really fall within their, their remit of training. Yeah, but people often said that the, the new generation, the new atheists, the the the, uh, the famous uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know, you mentioned several of them. Um, th th their level of discourse as atheists, their polemic, is considerably inferior to the atheists of older generations. People like Bertrand Russell, for example, um, yes. who had that famous debate where he was a British philosopher, uh, amongst many other things, mathematician, a true genius in many ways. He was an atheist. Um, and he had a wonderful debate with a, a guy called uh, Copleston, who was uh, a Jesuit professor at Heathrop, wh where I where I went to actually. And uh, you can actually you see, actually hear it or see it or, online. And the level of discourse in that was very very subtle, <laughs> and, and and the arguments deployed were. And and what was interesting um, is Bertrand Russell's. He got in. He was put into a corner um, in this dialogue, and he his response to when he was put in this corner about the existence of God was very very interesting. And quite extraordinary. I expected a man of his genius to have much better. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that, but but the, I'm just trying to say that Bertrand Russell wasn't full of um, you know you know nastiness and mockery and hubris no. and dismissal. Uh, and well, I'm not going to take any of this seriously kind of attitude. He took religion seriously, even though he was an atheist. And his arguments are much more sophisticated. And the point being that today's atheists are not like that. That, they, that there's been a decline in atheist arguments. <laughs> I think there's just a decline in. Um human endeavors and perhaps that applies to the atheist and to the religious scholarship we have currently um we I, I would say we seem to be far more interested in what we feel like doing or proving is true than the actual pursuit of truth and i guess that comes from the idea that currently in society or at least in the philosophical paradigm postmodernism doesn't have a conceptualization that there is anything absolutely true to be indeed yeah. worked out yes so in that case you're kind of I, I call them kind of buildings without foundations you construct very very nice sophisticated structures but they're not rooted in anything or for anything mm. and i guess in the islamic tradition i was actually reading um al ghazali he's got these very short books um letters to a disciple is one of them oh, yeah. and my beloved son is another one yeah but it's extraordinary and, uh, powerful uh, book books uh, yeah very, very. I mean, I think I have it to hand somewhere. Uh, I do here. Yeah. So this, these little short books that you can read. Mm -hmm. And I think somewhere he talks about knowledge. Um, but he kind of, he says that knowledge without action. Um, oh, I should find the page, but it's, it's uh, kind of knowledge without action is um pointless in a sense and action without knowledge is mm. misdirected or, mm. or without kind of it will lead you astray and i think this is something that in traditional societies or religious societies was very much understood that knowledge for the sake of knowledge doesn't mm. do anything for the human condition but yes knowledge should always be directed towards something and then yes. there's this this kind of distinction between knowledge and wisdom. Yes. And and this is, I think, where perhaps modern society places the intellect above. We don't believe in the soul anymore, but if you do believe in the soul or spirituality. Mm. And I think if you want to come back to, again, the Islamic tradition or the Christian tradition, you know, the, the devil, shaitan, he knows everything there is to know. He's supremely smart. He's super, super clever. Mm. You know, he, he can see the unseen even more than we can. Mm. Um, and he has all this intellect, but it doesn't make him believe or submit. Submit, yeah. Because he believes right. in God, an atheist. He believes he? in God. He, 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 yeah. he knows God, yeah. but he still doesn't follow what God asks him to do, which is, mm. which is kind of where you can see... Um, the separation between knowledge and wisdom because a wise person adheres to what god is asking them to do right. but orientalists are very very knowledgeable they know every, they might know more about islam than the common muslim 
yet they don't reap any of the rewards that it has to no. offer. No, it, it, it's it, as an intellectual yeah. exercise. Yeah, just interesting knowledge. Where, where Islam is calling for a moral context for our knowledge. That yes. what, why are we doing these things? What benefit do they bring to us rather than just acquiring knowledge for, for, for knowledge's sake, which is ultimately yes. futile and not profitable? Um, no. So that's quite an interesting distinction you're making. And, and this is what I would say is um, modern philosophy or modern education in general. Why do we learn? you know, why am I doing physics? Why am I doing English literature? Why do I go to work? The question of why seems to have somehow got lost along the way. And the answer mm -hmm. in the modern world doesn't seem to be very satisfactory, um, to me at least. You know, a lot of the people I did physics with now are bankers or 50% or, um, of them have gone into the city as a consultant or a banker. Um, whereas traditionally, you know, that's what you do. Right, right. right yeah. Whereas it, uh, someone like uh, Ibn Sina or, or some of you know some of our famous cosmologists or, or physicists did physics because it brought them closer to Allah. They did it because wow. they gained knowledge of creation. Yes, and the, um, the Quran constantly points to the created order as a place right. of signs that, that indicate that are meaningful. Yeah. That they they bring us closer to God and so on and so forth. Absolutely. So it's not just a, a disinterested accumulation of facts. It actually has a wider existential context. Uh, but what, what, and, why, do and, you, what, yeah. why do you do physics at Oxford? If I may ask you that, that's a great question. I did physics. My dad actually wanted me to be a lawyer. If we're talking about my kind of biography. But I did physics at, at university. I did my undergrad at Imperial College. And I did it because it was the only thing that truly surprised me in the classroom. It was intellectual curiosity. You know, other subjects I was I was quite good at. Um, I even did history for A-level, which is not common for people who go into sciences. No. Um, but so physics was, you know, the only subject that really piqued my interest, surprised me, gave me something to think about other things were just kind of regurgitation of knowledge or yes. knowledge for the sake of knowledge why not philosophy for example I mean, that, I mean, yeah, well, I, it's a great question i think if i could go back i'd do physics and philosophy at oxford but um i didn't know that this is where my intellectual curiosity actually lay i i wasn't exposed to it at school like i said you don't get to do philosophy very yeah. much at school no, no, no um, yeah, it had to be in France, where it is very much part of the curricula, I know. Yeah. But not here, unfortunately, in the UK. No, and but I, throughout the course of my study of physics, I realised I wasn't so much interested. I, I enjoyed the elegance of physics in describing the universe. Right. But I wasn't actually so interested in physics. I was more, it was a deeper interest in, I think, in finding some kind of, meaning or beauty in the world mm. perhaps and i think that's kind of where my desire to do physics came from and it's probably been the focus of most of my intellectual studies in my life now i do a very particular kind of physics i do uh, i make solar panels so it's called condensed matter physics um and so it's not theoretical physics it's not what people think of like einstein and those people who describe the universe for the mm. sake of describing the universe mine is a very practical form of physics right. where i try to apply my knowledge to do something that i think will contribute positively to society that's why i did my phd i was actually going to go into finance i, I mock my friends now but i was on the same path uh but i just thought if i wanted to live a meaningful life then i would rather do something that i thought had benefit to people using my knowledge mm -hmm. than simply kind of going and accumulating quite a lot of wealth yes um right. yeah so that's, that's kind of why that's, that's a, a, a very a very beautiful answer um can, can i um just come back to physics for, for uh, in itself for a second and just quote a paragraph from um john polkinghorne's book he, as we know he's uh, was professor of mathematical physics at uh, cambridge before he became a uh, a Christian priest and a theologian of equal distinction, uh, I would I would say, and there's a fascinating paragraph here in in this uh, book, which is Faith, Science, and Understanding, um, about quantum cosmology and the anthropic principle, um, and this is to do with the fine tuning of the laws of physics and how do we understand these? What do these tell us about the universe? And I just want to get your reflections on what he said, if you don't mind. Uh, Polkinghorne writes. 
The fine tuning of the laws of nature that is necessary if the physical fabric of the world is to be capable of eventually evolving carbon based life is an anticipated, unanticipated insight first recognized by scientists in the early 1970s. There's been much discussion of its possible meta scientific significance. John Leslie, this is, he's a philosopher by the way, reached a judicious conclusion when he stated that these remarkable coincidences call for some form of further explanation, whose character could take one of two different rational forms. And this is where it gets interesting. Either, this is the first option, there are many different universes, each with a different set of natural laws and circumstances. And we simply live in the one where, by chance, our evolution has in fact been a possibility to the multi-universe theory. Or the second version, or the option rather, there is a single universe whose endowment with fruitful potentiality is the expression of the will of the creator who has brought it into being. And then uh, Polkinghorne says, if this analysis is accepted as I think it should be, those who wish to avoid a religious conclusion will have to opt for the multiverse explanation. Their case would then be strengthened if they were able to reduce further reasons for belief in this vast portfolio of other worlds. I love his language here, a vast portfolio of other worlds. Otherwise, it will simply appear as an ad hoc stratagem of anti-religious intent. After all, theists, believers in God, can point to several other reasons for their belief in God, such as the existence of cosmic order and the existence of religious experience. So, so obviously, atheists go for multiverse. And uh, I mean, I'm not even sure that multiverse is somehow an anti-theist argument anyway, but I, I, I'm, I, I, at the end of the day. But what are your reflections and responses to Polkinghorne's characterization yeah. of this issue? I mean, again, it sounds exactly like him uh, very well written almost almost humorous in a very subtle way yes um, precisely but I, what i would say is if you consider what a multiverse is asking you to believe in it's asking you to believe that there are infinitely many mm. causally unconnected universes of which we um exist in one which has the particular set of um conditions required for we, let's take a step back not even just for life to exist but if the gravitational the gravitational constant which is the strength of the gravitational force is slightly different the universe matter cannot clump together so the universe either come turns back into a ball so the expansion kind of halts and comes back or it accelerates away so rapidly that you can't even get thing bits of matter to stick together. So no planets, no stars, nothing. You, we just have kind of dust. Right. So take that even further and then think about the other conditions required for life to form. It's a very, very unique universe that we, we live in. Mm. But the reason I mentioned causally unconnected, what that means is if you study physics or even philosophy, things which are causally unconnected are outside the realm of scientific investigation. Oh. So if something is causally unconnected, right. essentially I cannot, it cannot influence me and I cannot influence it. Mm -hmm. And to use that language means that I, in my understanding of the multiverse, you have to create you i don't think it's empirically verifiable if that makes sense mm -hmm. you can't verify in the same way you cannot verify the existence of god empirically you cannot do scientific investigations you could construct a theory and i think people do this they construct very elaborate theories using mathematics etc about how the multiverse could exist and whatnot but they aren't they're no different to something like the Kalam cosmological argument or, or some which are based on certain logical principles, um, to use that language. Mm. And then you have to ask yourself again, Paul, the question that we've said before, 
do you want to believe in God? Are you willing to accept the existence of God, which is what Professor Polkinghorne is kind of referring to there? Yes. Or do you want to, you know, and if you think about Occam's razor, for example, as something that people cite in the West as this kind of, you know, William of Ockham was actually, I think, a Christian, wasn't he? Yeah, he's an yeah. Englishman as well. But anyway, yes. that's not the point. But, but anyway, um, mm. uh, they speak about this kind of, uh, things believe in the simplest explanation is the best one. Yes, don't necessarily multiple explanations. The simplest one. Yes, I think the multiverse. Right, the multiverse is something <laughs> that you can construct in order to avoid the most right. intuitive conclusion, which is that right. yes, we are special, and right. there is a special specialness to our universe and to human beings. And this is one thing that's symptomatic, I think, of an atheistic position. Right. Is this idea that everything is coincidental and that human beings aren't special, we aren't special, nothing is special, nothing is sacred. It's a very unromantic, very grey, colourless view of the world, which doesn't fit well with human intuition. If you want to use language like fitra, intuition is, I think, suitable in this place, yeah. where if you just look at the magnificence of creation, yeah. intuitively, internalise it, the Quranic injunction, look at the sky, how we've made it without rifts and how we've adorned it. Yeah. You know, if you simply gaze at the stars, and this is why so many cosmologists were religious, because they looked at the universe and they saw beauty, mm. real beauty, you know, mm. an intuitive, internal, mm. aesthetic sense of how magnificent it is. And even if you take cold beauty, which I refer to as kind of how one wonderfully fine-tuned the universe is, those numbers that are precise to, precise to 100 decimal places, and that if you change the last decimal place, the universe doesn't form the way we need it to to exist. That's a type of beauty as well. Mm, mm. Then if you it's, can it's, combine it's, the two and... Yeah. Yeah, so you just say, you use the word beauty there, and I'm struck. I mean, Polkinghorne uses this word as, as, a, as a mathematical physicist. He talks about the elegance and beauty of ma mathematical equations, and that the that one of the, uh, I, think if, if I'm, I think I'm not misrepresenting him, one of the indications of the truth of a, a mathematical hypothesis uh, is its beauty. You know, if it was a very ugly um, mm. equation, th this is an indicator that it's probably not true. It's not accurate. It's not actually going to work. And I thought, how interesting that aesthetic considerations like that actually factor in his evaluation of mathematical formula. And nevertheless, that's what he said, I think. Absolutely. And and simplicity mm. of uh, mathematical equations or physical equations is held in very high regard. The right. reason Einstein... Einstein's not only correct, but he's beautiful. I, I studied general relativity. His, his construction, his ability to essentially describe gravity in four lines or four yeah. equations. Or, 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 e equals mc squared is an incredibly yeah, the, the, beautiful, tiny little statement. Exactly, exactly. The This is what I'm referring to. It's how do you want to view the world? And it is. it has to be a desire, right? There isn't, I think people have this conception that all oh, science is somehow objective. No, it has inherently a way of looking at the world and it forces you to look at a world a certain way, but you can choose to see the signs or see it as coincidence. You know, the human being is not separate from the science. The way we look at the world yeah. is, is inbuilt into the way we describe it. And, yeah. and this is why I think Muslims don't have as much Muslim scientists Abdus Salam was a very famous scientist at Imperial College who got the Nobel Prize for uh, for unifying the electro uh, uh, the weak force um, with the electromagnetic force, I believe. He was a, a devout Muslim, and and Muslims don't have such an issue because I think really what's happened is there's a disenchantment in the West with religion. Well, firstly with Christianity, and that's been put out to all religion. Whereas in Islam, we, we've not quite reached that point yet. And arg arguments being made whether we're going there or not. But people still, our theology is very simple. Uh, I, and our I, way have, of, I have an intuition that it's not going to happen like that. But no, I mean, 
that's probably I, mean, I, I, mean, I just get the sense that Islam is is getting ever more popular. It's growing yes. and is becoming more intellectually sophisticated and robust. Where it is intellectually sophisticated, robust, I should say. Not to go to the past great traditional scholars, but the no. thinkers today now, um, who I'm incredibly impressed with. You mentioned uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, but there are other people, many other people as well. And and I think I think it won't just because it happened to Christianity doesn't mean it's going to happen to Islam. No. No, absolutely. But this disenchantment with the institution of the church yes. has led to, uh, you know, you know, when Nietzsche says God is dead, he's kind of referring to in the hearts of the Europeans around him. You know, no one really believes in God in that they don't act like they believe in God anymore. And, True. and, and it's not in his view. I think it's not, it's no longer a sophisticated way for human beings to actualize their potential. Yes, uh, Christian, the model that Christianity presents, whereas Islam and science within Islam serves a purpose, a fundamental purpose, which is to bring us everything really should be an endeavor to bring you closer to your creator. Exactly. And, and Nietzsche himself actually has some positive things to say about Islam, actually. He wasn't he does. Really, uh, yeah. just dismissive of all religion, although he was in a sense. But but when it came to Islam, <laughs> Uh, paradoxically, he also says some very positive things about it. So, yeah, yeah, he viewed it as world affirming rather than world denouncing, right. which is how he viewed Christianity. Exactly. Um, and but the the point is that science within Islam um, doesn't create cognitive dissonance in the mind, or didn't traditionally. It does now when young Muslims do science in the West, right. because they're influenced by these other things we've been talking about, these metaphysical assumptions. But if your metaphysics is rooted in strong aqidah, strong uh, Islamic theology, then you don't get led astray. In fact, I think it really serves to strengthen your faith when you see how amazing the universe is. It doesn't even apply to Muslims. Someone like Anthony Flew, who was a very famous yes. atheist, when he, saw, when he came to understand how uh, fine-tuned the universe was, he began to believe in a god, not in a, a religious no, uh, it, particular it, it, religion, it, but he became a theist. God of, the God of Aristotle, who was an ancient Greek. Yes, God, exactly. And he, yeah. he became convinced that this isn't just uh, some kind of cosmic coincidence, that there yes. is design or, or purpose. Yeah. I think it was DNA, was um, one of the, 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 the structure of DNA, its complexity. For him, it clearly exhibited signs of design uh, rather than yeah. just random mutations and so on. Yeah. And, and so it's, it, you know, and it, it, it's really interesting where certain atheists or non-believers or whatever draw their lines. I think if you keep probing at people gently, and, and I don't really believe in debate in a sense, uh, because I think you can get very quickly attached to your position and it becomes about winning rather than about the truth. Oh, so I, I, I think see that, I see that speaker's corner every week. Yes, and so I, I don't really engage in that kind of thing. But within my group, I people often speak to me about science, and I'm uh, sorry, about religion and science. And off, I'm often astounded by how many people are actually just agnostic. There aren't, athe there aren't many atheists, shouty, loud atheists mm -hmm. going around. Uh, a lot of people in my group, uh, they're very pleasant, firstly, I would say. I don't hold this view that atheists or agnostics are bad people. No. In fact, actually, many of them are very good people with, with what I would say is slightly misguided. Um, they have good intentions and slightly misplaced their good intentions. Um, a lot of them just want to be nice and, and have a, a view of the world that for, allows you to be nice to other people and care for other people, particularly in my field of work, which is renewable energy. A lot of these people are motivated by trying to help others. And they engage very easily and openly in, in dialogue with me. And you'd be, su I go, I'm surprised as to how far people are willing to go towards believing in God. It's not actually that hard for a lot of people, even scientists. Yeah. yeah. But it, it usually comes down to they don't like the morality, if I'm being honest. The, 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 the moral injunctions is where people fall down quite often. Or, the yeah, it's essentially the, the way that they live life now is how they feel like they should live life. Right. Uh, and they don't want to go all the way. So okay. back, to this, uh, back to this issue again of uh, the unwillingness of the human being to submit to God. To something. Uh, yeah. You can entertain the deist conception, maybe, maybe not, or whatever. But the actual practical existential submission to right. the creator is is a step too far. Well, and that's why you have, you know, I would kind of pseudo spirituality in many parts of 
the mm. world western world now people are very interested in buddhism hinduism meditation uh taoism i myself during my journey read uh, the power of now by eckhart tolle which is an interesting book uh he brought some eastern philosophies to the west someone like alan watts is perhaps more famous in the uk um and they one thing i think people are realizing is this cold unromantic view of the world and of, of human beings doesn't fit well with what human beings actually need mm. you know this idea of looking for meaning in a meaningless world the absurdist argument that i think thomas nagel is, is kind of described um you, we need something to plug that gap science doesn't offer it to us as much as it may try we can't look to science and even though someone like sam harris tries to it's really hard to look to science for morality an explanation of aesthetics of of other really essential things to the condition of the human being mm. and by what what i think scientism has done is made the human being very one dimensional mm. if you are purposeless fundamentally purposeless then it's really hard to figure out how you should live your life and what you should do with your life uh, and what your daily practices should be and i what i do see a lot is a kind of sadness within within human beings in general but within a lot of people who don't have religious framework i see a lot of trying to distract yourself from what you view as the suffering around you uh in the world or, or you don't have a way to cope with it that's very sophisticated you may uh engage in is kind of like soft hedonism it's kind of if i as long as i'm not hurting other people but i'm seeking pleasure and i'm i'm in a job that i feel like is enjoyable then that's the way i should try and live my life but it still doesn't work for most people and if you look at depression in the U united kingdom which is where we live uh, it's on the rise and by 2030 it will be the biggest uh, kind of illness uh, according to some of the nhs statistics so it seems like this one dimensional cold view i call it cold and unromantic view mm -hmm. of human beings rooted in what was recently up until recently i would say holding science as the only form of knowledge which is acceptable um or uh, the only type of belief which is certain i think that's something yeah. as well mm -hmm. really doesn't help us very much as human beings mm -hmm. no it's very interesting um i'd like just to share um uh, uh, another author in fact a mutual friend of ours um dr shabir akhtar of the university of oxford he's a uh, a Muslim philosopher, actually, his PhD is in Kierkegaard, which I thought was incredible when I first encountered him. I thought, a Muslim with a PhD in Kierkegaard? How, how exotic! Um, Kierkegaard being a 19th century uh, Danish Christian philosopher, who's actually extremely interesting. I understand why he studied him, actually. But anyway, in, in this uh, this particular book, one of my all-time favorite books, I, I keep on saying this, but I read really a minute, The Quran and the Secular Mind, A Philosophy of Islam, is actually on um, one of Tim Winter, Winter's uh recommended books lists uh abdul hakim Murad from cambridge university uh under the it has, it has three categories introductory intermediate and advanced reading in his recommended reading list this is on the list under advanced reading um but it is uh a he's very eloquent in the way that polkinghorn is eloquent uh shabit actor is also very eloquent um and i thought it'd be helpful Hopefully, uh, just to quote um, some words from this book by Shabir Akhtar, when he contrasts the Quranic worldview with the scientific perspective. Now, he does it in a very interesting way, uh, in a very kind of oppositional way, but, but ultimately it's in a way that I think is helpful for the believer, be they Muslim or even non-Muslim, actually, because I think a, a, a Christian could probably affirm what he's saying as well. I like it. If, if I may just r read a, a bit from it, um, and obviously you're welcome to give your view on it. So Shabit Agdir writes, the Quranic, like the biblical worldview, conflicts with the scientific perspective, which assumes that the cosmos, the universe, is a self-contained set of patterned empirical sequences intelligible to us in terms of natural causality. The spatial temporal continuum is subject to dis discoverable lawful regularity. Recently, probability laws couched in statistical terms replaced the older laws of causality as physical indeterminacy complicated the picture at the subatomic level. 
a metaphysic of events now supplants the older metaphysic of natural objects or substances uncomplicatedly locatable in three-dimensional space. But nature remains autonomous and self-sustaining. Islam posits an additional supernatural realm and denies the autonomy of nature. Directly, actively and continuously, God sustains the world after creating it. He prevents the lowest heaven, our sky, from collapsing on sinful humanity, arranges the clouds, directs the winds that give rain and revive the dead earth, holds the birds poised in midair and keeps the two seas separate. Lots of Quranic references here, which I've not mentioned uh, in this because it'd be too cumbersome otherwise. And he concludes, the Quranic cosmology presupposes continuous interaction between the natural causal world and the supranatural realm of occult causality. By the way, the word occult causality, I think the cult means hidden. We can't perceive it. Causality means cause and effect. So the, the, the Quran presupposes this interaction between these two dimensions, the natural causal world and the supranatural realm of occult causality. Supernatural agents routinely act within and interpenetrate the natural world of empirical causality. The jinn, elemental spirits found in the intricate nexus of Arabic poetry, possession and madness are integral to the pre-Islamic outlook and remain part of modern Islam. Indeed, Iblis, the devil, is a jinn created from fire. His arrogant free will, here we go, his arrogant free will led him to freely reject God's rule. So he's not an atheist, he, he won't submit. He is, an, he is an actively malicious agent in human history. God too is active. He shapes the embryo in the womb as he pleases and removes the souls of sleepers at night so that each day is a fresh resurrection of the souls of those destined to live are returned to life until an appointed hour. In the spiritual interaction between the two worlds, human petition, prayer, piety, pure speech, and good deeds ascend to the unseen world. End quote. I, I could go on. It's just, he put that this picture is incompatible with modern science because he says that scientists feel obliged to reject on principle the possible existence of God, the devil, indeed all spirits, including those of the departed dead, the jinn, demons, angels, and other immaterial or, or incorporeal entities lacking space-time coordinates. As you can't measure them. Um, now, I could go on and on, but I, I think that's a very eloquent um, bit of prose. Um, and, he, and I love the way he talks about the different dimensions of reality the, and the interaction between them and how even, and it's something, you know, physics never would, would address, of course, how human petition, prayer, piety, pure speech and good deeds uh, ascend to the unseen world. That's a marvellous. I, I like that anyway. No, I agree. And uh, knowing Dr. Shabir personally, um, his uh, conviction certainly comes through in his writing. Uh, but in a very eloquent fashion. Um, one thing I would, a, a reflection upon perhaps what he has said is, I think he's very much correct. What we were referring to earlier, the idea that scientists now have this pride, which means that they do not like to accept that there are things they cannot explain using scientific methods. But one quick kind of ref, not refutation, but something to ponder for those and this is something that helped me for those people who subscribe to this way of thinking mm. is what in philosophy is referred to as a hard problem of consciousness. Mm. But it's really a very simple idea, which is if you just sit with yourself for a while and do nothing, don't even engage with the outside world. Um, Ibn Sina has the hanging man kind of experiment that he does. But if you just sit with yourself and come to terms with how remarkably special you are and unique you are. Your consciousness, this thing that from which all ideas emerge, but I 
but and philosophers perhaps agree cannot be described by an idea or by language in any meaningful objective way if you want to use that kind of language if you think that that is something which is unseen consciousness itself is immaterial unseen if you can accept that if you can accept how remarkable your creation is in the first place and not okay your physical body is remarkable yes but so is anything in the physical world but actually the emergence of your consciousness if you can get behind that and really internalize that and which is what i think prehistoric people did pre-modern people i should say that you know why you have such sophisticated <clears throat> philosophies about consciousness all around the world whether it be hinduism or taoism or islam or christianity whatever it, or stoicism whatever it is why are people so fascinated with consciousness and why is it that those deep thinkers those ruminators whether it be epictetus or or the buddha or you know the prophet peace be upon him when he goes uh to the the mountain uh and kind of stays in seclusion for a while why is it that when we sit with ourselves for a little bit of time and why is meditation now such a popular thing in the west that we realize that actually we're really special and consciousness is really special and immaterial and kind of intangible and indescribable but we all have this basic assumption that the consciousness that i have is the one that you have or whatever if you can get behind that existing once and how special that is i don't find it too hard a leap to th believe in in other immaterial things or even like reincarn re resurrection rather than reincarnation sorry but resurrection or or other realms of existence um because even something like time the perception of time the well, the perception of time isn't i don't think the perception of time is necessary for you to experience consciousness i think this is in ibn sina's kind of hanging man experiment if you are secluded from your sensory ex experiences of the world mm. uh, or even in ibn to fail has that very famous uh book. But, just, just to point out to people the hanging man thing is not like a man being hung like capital no, no. does it yeah. it's, a, it's a man suspended without any kind of support any kind of sensory awareness apart from his own consciousness and it's a, it's a very interesting experiment. You can Google it and read the Wikipedia article on yeah. it. But yeah, it's not a man Absolutely. being hung uh, by the neck. It's a man who has been suspended without yeah. any uh, means of support at all. Yeah, It's a kind of early idea of radical skepticism, which is adopted yeah. later by people like Descartes. And, yeah. and, and if, you, if you think about that, you don't you wouldn't essentially experience time in that sense. There is a, a timelessness in the present moment. Mm. There is a there is um, an ex time is something we extrapolate and experience moment to moment. But in moment itself, e you know, even in mathematics, you have the idea of an infinite set of infinitesimal moments creating something. Right. So if each moment is infinite in that it doesn't have uh, time, you know, time is something we measure between moments. You could say, but each moment itself is infinite. Then, if you think about these special kind of things, which is what meditation or prayer. Or, or presence teaches you to experience, then I think you start to regard human beings as a lot more special than the current way we look at ourselves or in the West or in certain parts of the world we are viewed as. And I think it's fundamental to all human societies previously that we recognize that we were special in some way. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we're seen as a cosmic coincidence that exists for a, a blip of a, uh, you know a blip in the universe that just comes and goes and whilst we're here we should just you know try and have fun um just very lastly if i may uh we, you, you've been we've been talking for over an hour and i appreciate you, your time is precious but uh, uh, could you just mention some of the books that have made a difference to your thinking maybe contemporary authors or other authors um yeah that, that, that are significant to you well i think if we're talking about the books that helped me regain my faith mm. um I mentioned the power of now. It's not even Islamic. It's not even really religious, but it it reignited my um, my thinking that there was something special about consciousness, and it gave me a way to cope with many of the interesting things in the wor world that I saw. This kind of suffering that human beings have, and that we create narratives in our minds 
based on pain and we have the ability to abstract and extrapolate. So if you could focus on the present moment, you can remove a lot of that suffering. Um, and that led me to also reading Marcus Aurelius. Meditations was quite good as well. Um, and I think reading those people... He was a stoic, a stoic, a stoic philosopher, probably the most famous one that's ever lived. But a lot of his yeah. thoughts are compatible with faith, uh, will come from faith even. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. He kind of has this idea of logos, which is the will of the universe, some kind of direction in the universe. And he had this idea of not being good because you gain anything or whatever, but being good for the sake of being good, which is quite an Islamic injunction, I would say. It's something we're compelled to do. You're not just good when someone's watching or you're not just good, you're good because it's virtuous, because there is something to be attained from goodness in and of itself. Um, but these kind of thinkers, it was really ironic that the faith which I had grown up in offered th these insights, but also a really sophisticated way to manifest that within yourself. So whilst these other philosophies give you a little indication of how you should behave, or, or, or the state of being you should try to achieve they don't tell you about uh your conduct with your parents mm. or financial conduct or praying five times a day there wasn't the practical element they had they had this kind of abstract idea of what you should do but no way to really uh, uh, no re regime to which you subscribe yourself and it still wasn't grounded rigorously in kind of theology or, or, or real faith or belief and which is really essential yeah, that's one of the things that people in the West often don't appreciate about Islam, perhaps. Uh, they think, of well, what is a religion? Well, religion is, you know, what you do on a Sunday morning. It's when you, when you pray, when you read the Bible. Well, Islam is called the deen, uh, which, yeah, it can mean religion, but it, it means much more, a way of life. It's, it's almost mm. like a civilization as well. So it encompasses the financial uh, and one relationship on parents, uh, uh, how one behaves, but, but also things like governance as well. It's partly political um uh, and economic and so on so it is uh, a dean a way of life uh, a civilization historically um so it really offers that completeness and hol that hol holistic uh way of living which a kind of just a purely spiritual kind of interiorized personal yes. life doesn't yes. really offer because it's fine no. to be spiritual but what does that mean economically what does that mean in terms of passing laws what does Absolutely. it mean in terms of, I mean, it doesn't offer anything, of course, but Islam does. Yeah. And I think uh, Christianity used to do that, particularly during the Middle Ages, during the, mm -hmm. the great medieval period of Christendom. Um, it certainly had that character then, not anymore, of course, but Islam still retains that character, I think. Absolutely. And, and so I think what made Islam unique and led me, my brother, actually, my younger brother studies philosophy at university. Oh. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a, he actually introduced me to your channel, uh, Paul. I really um, haven't done that. So. Yeah, yeah. And and he started to read. A f he went through a similar r renaissance in his religious conviction during uh, a few years ago during lockdown. Uh, and he he read Gaetan as a as a you know as oh. someone that he came across. Of course, you have Islam and the Destiny of Man. Oh, I'll wheel it out. I always do. There yeah. we go. <laughs> no, I do. Well, not a, it, yeah, at the very least, it's a pretty cover. So it's no no harm in you bringing it out. This is true. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fantastic book. But actually, the one that I think is even better is Remembering God, oh, which is okay. his other book. And it's got a blue cover. And I, I, I've left it at university. Um, but that is really good. I think Islam and Destiny Man is yeah, a nice, is the comprehensive book. Uh, the first book on Islam by a Muslim or anything I ever, ever read. And I remember yeah. I bought it from Waterstones at Piccadilly Circus uh, some time ago. And I read this and thought, this is good. What else has he written? And then I read <laughs> that one. Um, yeah. I, I, and before I knew it, even though I was a Christian at the time, in reading it, it transformed me. And I was Muslim in my inner being, even though ideologically, yes. creedally, I was still a Christian, but it actually completely yeah. changed me. And so I had to kind of collect my head and my heart in the end. Well, and, and the really cool thing about Gaetan is Gaetan, from if you read the, the, the introduction to Islam and the Destiny of Man, he's a radical skeptic at a very young age. You know, his mother wants him to not be atheist, but to be agnostic to, to find his own answer mm. uh, within the world. Um, and so he disregards everything he's taught from a very young age and through a very organic journey comes to the idea of Islam. And this is a theme that I think is really 
interesting when you, I'm very fascinated by people who convert to Islam, mainly because I almost feel like I did a semi conversion to Islam. Yeah, you did. Really. Yeah, you, you yes. did. Yeah. And, and if you, if you look at some of the people who convert to Islam, they do it very organically and very intuitively. I mean, I've got here, I've got the road to Mecca by Muhammad Assad. If you've not read that, that's quite another, a good book. Another great, great classic, uh, which I highly yeah. recommend. Um, which is, which is good to read, I think, because it's not, um, this, it's not prescriptive. It's quite, descript it's like a novel. It's almost a novel. Um, yeah. it's incredibly and, and, absolutely extraordinary book. Yeah. It, that's a, a good one to read. Um, Again, Guy Eaton's very good. I think if you were to listen to a podcast, I think listening to someone like Abdul Hakim Murad's Paradigms of Leadership on, um, there were two that were really good. I think William Williamson is a rem I mean, you could make a film about that man's life and that would be remarkable. And it's this idea that by going through the world, by a lot of them travel quite a lot, which is interesting, mm -hmm. to the East and other yeah. places. Yeah. They travel, they engage with nature, because um, Guyton was uh, born in Switzerland to British parents, yes. who was British and came back to London. And um, the, the, uh, Mohammed Assad, of course, who was Leopold Weiss, I think he was a Leopold Jewish Weiss. Jew originally. He ended up going to Saudi Arabia and living uh, with the yeah. Bedouin for years before he did his yeah. famous translation. So these were great travellers. Yes, and and uh, weirdly, a lot of them were ambassadors for their nations or various nations. And yeah, Mohammed Assad was ambassador for Pakistan to the United Nations. Pakistan, yeah, oh, yeah. And, I, and I, and, yeah. and he was actually a diplomat for the British government. He was a diplomat, indeed, and I think he was in Egypt and Jamaica and other places as well. But yeah, yeah, yeah. but the point is, when they travel through the world on their journeys, and if you read about what they experience, you can get a flavour for Islam that you don't necessarily get. Um, in your community in East London or Birmingham or wherever you've grown up, um, you get a very organic feel of what it's like when a, when a group of people have internalized the teachings of Islam. Mm. Um, and they, through very organic uh, movements in the world, not through being um, preached to or shouted at, but rather through their own experiences and journeys and interactions with Muslims, day-to-day yes. -day interactions were convinced of this way of life and this is one thing i think that is perhaps lost in our in our discussions about islam is we don't uphold the con the character of the faith yet we expect people to perhaps be convinced by it and and if that is lacking in your local communities i would say that books are a really really good way to get a taste of what it actually feels like so again i read guy Eaton, uh, and and Muhammad Assad is good as well, and and you can you can just read about these people's stories. Um, so that's one type of reading. The other type of reading that I I did was kind of philosophical reading. Oh yeah. Um, and so you know you've got the Divine Reality by Hamza Sortis. I think if you are someone who uh, would I, like, I it's over there. I'm not going to get up and get it, but anyway, yeah. is it, is it, considering it held, consider it held up. Mm. Yes. Mm. Um, if you need, if you're if your issues with Islam are um, philosophical, if they are the types of doubts that are philosophical or theological, then that's an excellent read for someone who's not trained in philosophy to get a grasp for what Islam offers as a comprehensive solution to life's deepest questions and what the current Western uh, alternatives are. So materialism or philosophical naturalism or whatever these other ideas are and what does islam offer as our um and as hamza puts it our more intuitive and more all-encompassing mm, like conception that. of the world you've got the, you've got um, the fitra and then you've got the the, the total the totality actually. yeah there's the, there is an occam's razor kind of element to it yeah. where the islamic conception of god and our philosophy doesn't feel so disconnected and so so sophisticated to the point where you can't understand what's going on mm. uh, it has this very it, it fits very well with the human being and then it and then it kind of answers all possible questions mm. and whether or not you want to accept those answers Ham hamza says is a different point entirely but yeah. if you want to understand that we have um we have good answers to life's questions then that's a good comprehensive book for you to read and i think 
he's revising some things that he would like to adapt now. There are certain chapters, he, he may come up with a new edition soon. Uh, I, I, I think there are certain things that he would like to readdress. But broadly speaking, I found it to be very, very engaging, quite fun, uh, and, and not, not sophisticated in the way that some philosophy can be, that you can't read it if you're not trained yeah. in philosophy. I, I think just just very briefly, uh, one of the things it, you say it answers all these questions. There's one thing I found about Christianity as a Christian, that it didn't really have any good answers and really serious questions, like the problem of evil. You know, why do we suffer? Mm. You know, God, God loves yeah. us. He's a Christian. You know, God loves us. He's a loving God. He's a loving father. Okay, well, what, why, is my, why is my granny dying of cancer? Well, why is this child? Die? You know, it, didn't really, it doesn't actually have an answer. If you, if you Google this for Christians, you look at what the Archbishop of Canterbury has said about this issue. They basically, they shrug their shoulders and they say, well, God knows. Well, we don't know. We yeah, have no on. idea why. Now, that, that's fine. And that sounds like Job, actually, in the, in the Old Testament. He, he, after all these chapters about all these, eventually God speaks out of the whirlwind and comes up with, well, very little, actually. It doesn't say very much. Islam, however, does have, I think, very satisfying answers, both intellectually and existentially. Um, mm. And that was one of the extraordinary um, revelations to me, uh, encountering Islam, was that it did have answers which made sense um, to the problem of suffering, the problem of evil in the world. And uh, I thought, wow, a very Christian would, Christianity would take these or nick them or do anything with them, but it doesn't. It just ignores the answers. Uh, which could be incorporated in Christianity, I think. Yeah, and I think there are doctrines in Christianity, like uh, which are quite world denouncing, as we've said before. Yeah, yeah. Um, original sin is something that people cite quite easily, and so there's this idea that the world is somewhat inherently bad in some Christian theology, oh, yeah. which That's we true. don't have in Islam. In, in yeah. us, the world is. Uh, a reflection of God's majesty and, and beauty and you know that's why the world looks so nice but then we're also tested uh, through trial and tribulation and it's a path through which everything is in my conceptualization of Islam I would say although not trained I would I would like to caveat that there are people who could speak far uh, more sophisticatedly than I can about these things but I would say life seems to be a journey towards achieving proximity with God uh, and and if you and you do that not just by engaging with the beauty and the goodness of the world, but also by making yourself strong and resilient to the difficulties and trials of the world. Mm. Right? You require both. Both are necessary paths, and different people have different amounts of both, uh, and uniquely set amounts so that they can achieve the proximity that they require. It's a unique test for each individual. But if you if you try and, and this is one thing I've found if you endeavour in the path of trying to get close to to God, then there is a there is a uh, a supernatural aid that you will encounter somewhere along the way, which makes it far easier for you. It did not take me very long, Paul, to regain my faith with a degree of certainty which I'd never experienced in anything before. Gosh, uh, I would say a, a few months, perhaps a few months of sincere endeavour gave me the sincerity and this is a type of sincerity that one can only taste if you look at our tradition uh it's it's an epistemology it's an epistemological certainty that you cannot describe to another person you know in in al-ghazali's writings he says you know it's uh, i actually won't use the example he uses because it's a slightly profane example but it's very humorous mm -hmm. but uh, a similar mm -hmm. example is that if i was to describe to you what sweetness is you wouldn't know but if I gave you a spoon of honey, mm. then you would know. Mm. And that is a kind of spiritual proximity and and uh, and certainty that I think Islam can give the soul, the soul, the 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 that part of the human being that you can't get from other things, no matter what they are. I don't think any other tradition can give you that uh, in to the degree that Islam can, nor give you a framework for achieving it. Um, and these, this is what Gaetan expresses, I think, quite well. It's, mm. um, it's that there's both an inward and outward. There is not a realm which Islam cannot encompass or solve for you. And mm. and if anyone has any issues surrounding uh, this kind of thing, and they think that I'm someone who perhaps has encountered something similar or would like to talk to me about it, Paul, you're more than welcome to link uh, any of my uh, my stuff. But one thing I would say is. To use myself as an example, I am not learned um, 
into I, I like to read a little bit and I like to have discussions with people, but I, I'm not a particularly I'm not a supremely intelligent person. I have some intelligence, um, which I'm grateful for. Um, and I've, I've not studied a, a madrasa in, you know, Al Azhar or, or, or one of those places. Uh, and I'm not super learned in, in anything really, but I have had a quite human experience of what it's like to have doubts about your faith and mm. how you can reconcile them. And that was the only purpose I came on your show for. I, I hope my intention was really to get across that through some sincere endeavor, you can come to a degree of certainty about faith, which is even greater than your faith in science. If that wow. makes sense. Oh, that's a, a, a beautiful uh, conclusion or climax even to uh, the, the whole thing. Well, well, thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Sakhalin Chow, for your, your time, your insight and, uh, and your intelligence and your prodigious uh, learning, contrary to what you claim, I think it's evident. Um, not many people have read uh, most of the things that you have read, I, I suspect. Um, and um, I will link uh, in the description below to uh, to the things you spoke uh, about to, to your own work. So um, thank you very much indeed for your time. Till next time. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure.